Okay, let's begin. Um, I think everything's working now. Got the Facebook, the, the Zoom, the, everything's working. So hopefully um, everything's on. Okay, Baruch Hashem. Okay, let's start. So last time we talked about um, cooking on Shabbat, um, the, the prohibition of Bishul on Shabbat, which we said is... In, in the most rudimentary basic form is anything that can either be not only necessarily food, but also anything that can be melted, anything that can be roasted, anything that can be um, um, basically changing a, like a substance, right? So dyes um, was the, the main thing that they used to use in the, the, uh, the when building the Mishkan, they would melt the dyes. And so that's one of the, that's, that's the reason why the cooking um, came about. So last time we talked about really a lot of the um, halachot on cooking in a regular manner, for example, on an oven or inside an oven or um, on a fire. So today we're going to talk a little bit about the, um, a secondary source of heat. We're going to move on to, you know, cooking with the sun and then since we already talked about um, a lot of the halachot of Kli Rishon and Kli Shani um, back in the summer when Rabbi wasn't here. So we're going to skip to um, squeezing um, fruits. And we're going to see if uh, we're allowed to squeeze fruits, if uh, how we can do it, and when it will be allowed. Okay. So the Torah forbids cooking foods over a fire on Shabbat, or even to cook using the heat of something else that has been cooked, uh, that has been heated with a fire. So, for example, let's say you have your, your chamin, right? You made your chamin, your cholent, your stew. You had it on the, um, on the fire all of Shabbat. Is Facebook might still be working. I'm not sure. Okay. Okay, we're back on in uh, Zoom. Okay. So, so the question was, let's say I have my chamin. It's hot. It's steaming. I'm ready to eat it, but I find no egg. I want to put a... Uh, a soft boiled egg, you know, not not uh, cooked egg, into the chamin, into the stew. Leave it in there for a couple, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Come back. You know, it's probably going to be cooked by then, right? Um, and then you don't think it's going to be cooked? Or you don't think it's allowed? <laughs> or she doesn't understand uh, what happened. Uh, well, the oh, the timing. Okay, let's say, I, I don't know how long it usually takes to make a hard boiled egg. Right, but usually let's say 15 20 minutes max. Right, so that's if you're putting it on like a, on, a, on a fire, but over here I'm putting it in the stew, you know, I'm putting it inside the chamin, inside the uh, cholent, um, after I took it off the fire. And I'm, I'm gonna say, you know, it's not gonna be cooking, I'm not, it's not on a fire, it's not on a plat, and it's not on anything on electricity, it's not on gas, it's not on anything, it's inside the chamin that was on the fire. So, is that considered cooking? So um, so, so the so what we're saying here is anything that was heated by a fire cannot uh, is also considered cooking. So if I put the egg, for example, in a pot of food like the chamin, right, and the chamin's hot and it's going to cook the egg, then that's considered cooking um, even on Shabbat. So you would have to have to put the egg before Shabbat into the uh, into the cholent into the chamin. Um, the act of cooking in this manner is equal to cooking with the heat of the fire itself. Therefore, if one cooks food in a hot oven after removing all the coals and ashes from it, or if one cooks uh, something in a pot of boiling hot water um, after it has been removed from the fire, he is guilty of performing a melacha of mevashel. That's another good uh, uh, way, right? Let's say I have my hot water, right? I pour my hot water into a cup, and in this cup, which isn't heated by any source, I put a hard uh, egg. To, to cook, right? That's also, we said, is not allowed. Um, that's also considered cooking. Um, cooking with an electric, like a, it's gonna be basic, but cooking with an electric appliance is the same as cooking with a fire. Um, most of nowadays, uh, a lot of the, the stoves are electric, right? So you wouldn't be able to cook anything there. Electricity, I once heard a, a joke, you know, some people say, you know, electricity isn't fire. You know, fire, when the, when the, when the Torah was talking about Melachot on Shabbat, they wanted the fire. They said the fire. Okay, nowadays we have electricity. You know, we can turn on the, the lights. What's the problem, right? It's not like we're lighting a fire. So, um, 
so I heard from uh, Rabbi Mansur, he said that um, if, if that's how you want to go, then instead of, uh, you know, in Shemaim, when they, when they judge you, instead of putting you on the fire, they'll put you in an electric chair. What's the, what's the difference, you know? <laughs> so, um, so electricity would be the same thing as, uh, as fire in that case. Um, that means that anything that you have, uh, uh, that you can cook on, let's say, an electric stove would also be asul, it would be prohibited on Shabbat. Um, it is forbidden to cook using microwave ovens, even if it is programmed with a timer to turn on automatically on Shabbat. There is no room for leniency concerning this, even for the sake of someone who is moderately ill. Um, if someone must, according to the doctor's orders, cook food on Shabbat for the sake of a desperately ill, it is preferable that he cooks in a microwave oven. So we, we haven't really talked about um, the... So we're going to talk about the sun in a second, Yariv. Um, we had a question about what about, you know, natural sources such as suns, let's say hot springs. We're going to get into all of those soon. Uh, it's a good question, though. Um, so microwave oven, um, we didn't really talk about the issue of, you know, cooking for someone who's sick, who's ill, who may be bedridden. Um, we'll, 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 we'll one day talk about that. But usually when you're cooking for someone who's, uh, who needs to be, have a hot food or whatever it is, cooked food on Shabbat, um, it's better to do it in a different way. So maybe instead of using a, a gas stove, you know, you would use a, a microwave oven. Um, if it's, a, if it's, you know, less kind of like a direct melacha, which the direct melacha, again, is fire. Um, mic a microwave oven then uses microwaves to, to heat up the food. So maybe that's a, it's, it's a different. It's, it's a little less um, stringent. At the end of the day, it's still stringent, but um, like the Gemara says, um, the, um, the lashes that are, are given from a biblical um, prohibition will hurt the same as the lashes given uh, from a rabbinic prohibition. There's, there's no difference. Um, it is possible that cooking food in the microwave oven is not considered an act of nevushah, according to the Torah, like a... Uh, this is what I was, I was alluding to. If that it is so that the rule of Ein Bishul Achar Bishul would not apply to food that has been cooked in a microwave oven. If a food was cooked in a microwave oven until it was well done, it may not be reheated on an electric warming tray on Shabbat, since it may not be considered cooked according to Halacha. So now he's saying that, let's say before Shabbat, I don't know anyone who does this, but maybe they were rushed or whatever, they, they decided to, instead of cooking on a, on a gas or on a, on a fire, they cooked it inside the microwave oven. I don't know, maybe you put like a piece of uh, meat in the microwave oven, uh, raw meat in the microwave oven, and it got to the point where it was, you know, um, edible, right? So they're saying at that point, let's say you did all that before Shabbat, now on Shabbat you want to eat that piece of meat that is edible, and you put it on the electric warming tray, that wouldn't be allowed because technically it wasn't cooked. Um, because we're going to say that the microwave doesn't really cook, it maybe just heats it up or whatever it does, but it's not considered cooking to, uh, according to the Torah. And therefore, if you, if you were to cook something before Shabbat in a microwave oven or an ov a microwave, you wouldn't be able to put that on a, on a plata, on an electric warming uh, tray on, sh uh, on Shabbat. Um, okay. It is forbidden by the Torah to ignite, ignite a fire on Shabbat by concentrating the sunlight onto a point uh, using a magnifying glass. Yeah, this is a melacha of ma'avir, which is creating a fire. Um, using the concentrated sunlight to ignite a fire is just as much an act of kindling a fire as igniting uh, it in any other manner. He's saying there's no difference, you know, if you take a magnifying glass and you use the sun, or you take a lighter. At that point, you're either way you're creating a fire, um, and, and you're still, it's the same um, prohibition. Some poskim rule that the same applies regarding the melacha of mevashem. That if someone ignites a fire underneath, underneath a pot of food using a magnifying glass and cooks it, it is the same as cooking it with any other fire, and he's uh, guilty of the melacha of mevashem. Other poskims rule that this is not the case um, of mevashem, that the Torah forbade, and it is forbidden only by our sages. Um, in practice, we, we go by the, the, um, the first opinion, so we don't rely on any leniency uh, using the sunlight um, with a magnifying glass is uh, considered creating a fire, and that would uh, be considered mevashel um, if you created that fire and it was um, cooking something. 
Um, also with hot springs, I know that was a question of Yariv, um, that it is forbidden to cook anything with the natural hot springs. So let's say you, you, you wanted that egg, right? So you put it inside a hot spring, you know, it cooked, whatever, take it out, that would be uh, cooking on Shabbat. Even though it's natural, even though it's something that's, um, you know, in, in this world, that it's still, you created that act of um, cooking. Um, so, but, but he says that it's uh, technically not um, from the Torah. So if someone does uh, do that, he did a uh, rabbinical prohibition, but not a uh, biblical prohibition. Um, so now, uh, to Yarev's other question about the sun. So we said that you can't use the sun for, um, with a magnifying glass to create fire. Well, what happens if it's a very hot day, which sometimes here in Dallas, you know, it can get really hot. You take a frying pan, you put it outside, you crack an egg, and you say, okay, let's see. Let's do an experiment. Can, uh, is, it, is it that hot in Dallas where I can, uh, where I can cook an egg? So the halacha is, it is permissible to cook on Shabbat using the direct heat of the sun. For example, one may place a container of water or an egg in the sunlight so that it will heat up and become cooked. Our sages instituted a rule forbidding us to cook on Shabbat with the heat of an object that has been heated by the sun. So for example, if someone left water in the sunlight until it became yet so that it was really hot, um, it is forbidden to immerse an egg in the water so that it will cook, um, that it will, that, so the egg will cook in it. Our sages f uh, feared that this would bring people to um, making an error and thinking, okay, if, if, you know, if you use the sunlight to heat up water, then so I can also get the water from the, from the water heater and uh, use that. What's the difference? This is hot water and that's hot water. So anything that's heated by the sun, there's, there's a disconnect between the sun and the object that was heated, right? You have the, the water that is now hot. So at that point, um, it's not going to be allowed to put an egg in there. Right. Um, but it seems like that if you, let's say, I don't know, put an egg outside and, uh, and the sun heated it up until it was hard boiled, that would be allowed uh, on Shabbat. Um, it says, for this reason, it is forbidden to cook an egg on Shabbat in scalding hot water that was heated by solar power and comes through the faucet. So in, in, in Israel, it's more, um, it's more seen. Here, you don't really have solar powered water heaters. But in, um, in Israel, it's, a lot of people have the uh, Dut Shemesh. It's, it's the, um, the, the water heater that's usually on the roof that is um, solar power. And so that, you know, all, all, the, all the heat is really coming from the sun. He's saying even the, so, if, it all, if it's all coming from the sun, it's still um, disconnected from the sun. And therefore, it would be for, forbidden. Um, it is permissible to use a magnifying glass or a prism on Shabbat to concentrate the sun's rays onto a glass of water or some other beverage and heat it until it is scalding hot. So what we said before with a magnifying glass is you can't use the magnifying glass to create a fire. But if you're going to use the magnifying glass to heat something up, that would be fine. So let's say I have my tea. My tea got cold. All right. So I'm going to take the magnifying glass, you know, in the, in the summer of uh, Dallas, which... Maybe you don't even need the magnifying glass. Maybe you can just put it outside and it'll get hot. Um, but that, that would be allowed on Shabbat. Because um, this is not considered uh, cooking since you're using the, sun's, uh, the sun again. right? It's a direct source from the sun. Um, furthermore, it is permissible to aim the magnifying glass onto the side of a pot in order to cook the food it, uh, it contains. Although the metal of the pot itself becomes hot and heats the food it it, contain, uh, it contains, and the result is that the cooking of the food is accomplished through the combined heat of the sun itself and the heat of the material, it is permitted. Because at the end of the day, why is, why is, why is it getting heated? Because of the sun, right? We said with the water, if it's heated and then you can't put the egg in it, is because now it's a different entity. Now it's hot water, and you're putting the egg in hot water, and we don't want people to come to error in that. But if you have a, a pot of hot, you know, a pot of food, or like I said, a frying pan, let's say, right? Um, which we'll, we'll see in a second, um, the, there's, there's not, no disconnect between the sun, the sun's heat and the sun's rays, to the act of um, cooking. Um, so th this is considered, uh, according to the Talmud, uh, Talmudic um, phrase, it's called the ze goven, meaning this and this causes. So it's the causation of the mm -hmm. heat of the sun combined with the causation of the... Um, um, Rabbi says hi, by the way. Um, 
uh, the, so the the sun the, the combination of the sun's heat with the magnet the metal that it's being heated by that creates this um, this this extra heat but at the end of the day it's the the, the sun's heat that's causing the, um, the 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 cooking let's say so with that in mind some posts can rule that it is permissible to roast an egg on Shabbat using the heat of a rooftop that has been scalding hot from the sun they claim that it is not uh, uh, pos uh, that it is not possible to impose our sage's prohibition in this case, since permitting this will not lead anyone to heat his uh, rooftop with a fire in order to cook it, uh, his food. So one of the reasons we say we say cooking isn't allowed on Shabbat or heating up food is allowed on Shabbat in a certain way um, is because we're, we're scared that he's going to turn it the the heat up. When he, because he's hungry, he, you know, he's he's getting hangry. And he's like, no, I want the food already. So he turns it up a little bit, and you know, he's increasing the fire, and yeah, that's going to be that's going to be an issue. Um, but in this case, we're going to say that he's using the heat of, let's say, I don't know, the bricks or or whatever it is on the roof to heat up the uh, the food. At that point, we're gonna, not going to be worried because I don't think he's going to create a, a bigger fire on his roof um, in order to eat. Um, so there are other post that rule uh, that it is nevertheless forbidden since our sages prohibited cooking on Shabbat using the heat of any item heated by the sun and not allow for any distinction. So the other post game, and that's, this is what the halakha is, is that, again, if you're disconnecting the sun from the object, it's going to be bad. So let's say I have a frying pan and I leave it outside in this Dallas heat, right, on top of a black car or something like that. I take it, it's, 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 it's scorching, right? You can barely hold on to it. You know for sure if you take an egg and you put it on that, for sure it's going to roast, you're going to have a nice omelet, all right? So that wouldn't be allowed because it doesn't look like the sun is, um, is heating up the egg. It looks like the, the whatever it is, the, the pan or the, the car, whatever it might be, is heating. At that point, it's forbidden because there's a disconnect between the sun's rays and the source of the, the heat. What we said earlier with the pot of food um, and using the magnifying glass to, to heat up that pot, we're, we're, we're seeing at, at the end of the day that the sun is causing the pot to, to heat up and uh, that's causing the food also inside to heat up. So that's what we said is a ze, a ze goren, this and this um, causes. But over here again, the sun and the actual cooking object, which in this case would be the frying pan, um, at that point, we're going to say that the post game say that's not uh, allowed, again, on a rabbinic side. On a biblical side, there's, uh, there's no issue, again, because there, there's no fire, there's no actual um, melachav of cooking. Um, but again, the uh, rabbinical lashes hurt as much as the biblical lashes, so you don't want to um, don't wanna go against their words. Um, so, like we said in Israel, they have a solar power um, heating systems. So uh, those who have solar power uh, water heating systems in their house are permitted to turn on the hot water faucets on Shabbat and use the hot water uh, per, um, for washing dishes or to wash one's hands or feet or any other purpose. It's permissible to use the water heater that was heated on Shabbat itself um, and certainly to use on Friday evening the water that was heated on Friday afternoon. Um, even, even so, um, bathing one's entire body in warm water is forbidden on Shabbat. So even if it's a uh, solar power um, water, and you're going to say, you know, but we're allowed to wash the dishes or wash our hands, that, you're right, is allowed. But washing the whole body is, uh, is not allowed. Um, it's going to explain the, the whole purpose now. So this, le this leniency needs explanation. For at first gl glance, it appears that this is an act of cooking using something heated by the sun. And didn't we just say that if, for example, you, you use the hot water, you put it in a cup and you put um, an egg in it, isn't that cooking? So when the hot water faucet is turned on, hot water runs from the reservoir where it is stored, and that water is immediately replaced by cold water that runs into the reservoir. The cold water mixes uh, with the ex existing hot water, and as a result, all the water in the barrel is scalding hot. Therefore, this is an act of cooking cold water using the heat of water that has been heated by the sun, and it should be forbidden. So it seems like, well, why is this allowed, right? In general, when you turn on the hot water, it's an act of cooking. Why? 
because when you turn on the hot water, the cold water comes into the water heater, and the water heater heats it up, and you're cooking water, right? Even though you didn't mean to, um, you didn't mean to cause that cold water to come in. It's uh, it's called a psik ratio. It's uh, it's uh, something that's for sure gonna happen, and because it's for sure gonna happen, it's like you did it yourself. Even though you might not have thought of it, you didn't do. But because your act caused it to happen, um, and it's a direct cause, therefore we're gonna say that it's uh, considered uh, cooking. But over here, seemingly we just said that it's allowed. So what's the difference? So um, when someone turns on the faucet, he does so in order to cook water in the barrel. His intentions are only to use, uh, sorry, he does, not, uh, he does not do so in order to cook water in the barrel. His intentions are only to, uh, to use the water that is coming out. And by turning on the hot water, he will definitely cause the cold water to enter the barrel and become cooked. And it is a case of psikoresha that we said a psikoresha is something that's for sure going to happen because of uh, your action. Um, and usually that would be forbidden when the, the when uh, when performed without intention. So even if you didn't intend for it to happen, like what we said, <coughs> because um, because it's something that you caused and you know it was going to be caused at that point, um, it should be forbidden. But that is only true concerning an act of melacha that the Torah forbids. So in that case, when you turn on the, the water and it heats up the water, what is it heating it up with? Probably fire or, uh, or electricity, which we consider that a Torah prohibition. But cooking with the heat of the sun is something only forbidden by our sages. And there's a, there's a rule that um, anything that is... Um, the post can rule that it is permitted to perform an act on Shabbat, even if it is an act of psikoresha that will inevitably result in an act forbidden by our sages, since that is not a person's intention. So when it comes to a derabanan, we're going to say psikoresha derabanan delo nichale, which means that a psikoresha is something that for sure is going to happen, but it's a derabanan, it's something from the rabbinical um, um, prohibition. If he doesn't have intentions for doing that act, it's going to be allowed. So in this case, when um, when he t when he turns on the hot water for the for the with the solar power um, solar power water heater, that's going to be allowed to use for washing dishes or his hands. But to use in most of our houses, I don't think we have any solar power uh, water heaters. It would be forbidden to use because that would be a clear case of an act of uh, cooking. Um, because it's going to be heated by the fire or the electricity, whatever it is. Um, likewise, if a non-Jew heated water for his own use on Shabbat, uh, Jews may use that water to wash their hands, face, and feet, to, or to wash dishes, since no sin was committed in uh, heating that water. Um, there's there's also an idea that with uh, non-Jews, there's no idea of psikoresha, that they, they, they're causing one act to cause another act, even if they're not thinking uh, uh, about that. And so if a, a non-Jew decides he, let's say you have a maid um, and she's doing the dishes and she decides to use hot water, you can tell her to leave it on and you can use it to wash your hands or your face or your feet, whatever you need. Um, and that wouldn't be an issue. Um, okay, final halakha here in uh, cooking. Again, we, we did most of these over the summer uh, with the Kli Risho and Kli Shani. Um, and so I, I hope we all remember that at least a little bit. Um, and so we're going to sk skip that um, and go to a different topic, but uh, let's do this final halakha. If the water from the hot water faucet is too hot to use comfortably, it is technically permissible to turn on both the hot water faucet and the cold water faucet at the same time. So again, we're talking about here um, the case where you're using the hot water from the, the solar power water heater, right? And let's say it's too hot, you're like, oh man, it's too hot. So technically you can put both of them on, the cold and the hot, at the same time to neutralize. I, you might be scared, wait a second, that cold water is going to be heated by the, the hot water. We're going to say that, that that's not a, 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 this is not a reason to forbid this action, uh, since the faucet is connected through pipes to the water barrel where it is heated, and the faucet itself um, is part of a Kli Rishon. Um, so really it's going to be like a cliche -ny, and a cliche -ny, what like we said, is... Um, when it's a hot water and it's cold water, it doesn't really it doesn't really cook, um, 
And so technically it's, a, it's allowed. Again, not, none of us really have um, solar powered water heaters. Um, but he says over here that one who refrains from doing this will receive a special blessing in heaven. So better to do that, right? <laughs> I, I personally don't do this every week so because I don't have a solar power heater. But So hopefully I'll be blessed. Okay, now we're going to skip um, to uh, the Melachav Dash, uh, Schita, which is going to be the, the idea of squeezing fruit. So it's the same thing uh, as kind of like um, cooking, you know, food. I thought, okay, well... We'll continue with this food-related thing, um, and and these these halachot cooking we kind of know, cooking for for a big idea we know. Okay, I can't cook whatever it is. I can't you know use the fire. I can't use the, to make eggs. You know, these uh, we talked about tea, um, but what about what about you know something? And we'll see some of these halachot we we don't really think about. So the act of squeezing olives or extracting um, um, oil. Um, or grapes to extract their juice is a capital offense of uh, Shabbat desecration. So if you squeeze a grape or you screw, squeeze an olive on Shabbat in order to get the oil or to get the juice of the uh, grape is a um, is a biblical um, prohibition. Um, the, it's called mefarek, which means to t- take apart because you're taking the, uh, the beverage that is contained in the fruit. Um, and this is a tolada, this is like a, an offspring of the Melachav Dash, which Dash is breaking uh, the kernels um, from the from the chaff. So you know, back then they had the the wheat, and in order to get the the grains of wheat, you'd have to either hit it or you'd get like a rolling stone and roll it over the the grains. So that's that's the idea of Dash, and um, that, that's the, the the idea is to to take one thing out of another. Okay. And that also relates to taking juice, taking uh, oil out of fruits. So oil, uh, uh, olives and grapes, that's from the Torah. The sages added to this all, you know, all the other fruits, basically. And so, um, for example, if someone wants berries or pomegranates and he wants to extract the juice from, um, from those, it would be forbidden since it is common to squeeze these fruits for their juice, our sages feared that if someone would be permitted to extract those juice juices, um, it might lead people to also um, extract the juices of olives or grapes. So they, they, they made a fence. They said, you know, if olives and grapes aren't allowed, nothing's allowed. Because, you know, one might come to do a, a different uh, uh, juicing and maybe they'll take a grape instead of a, a blueberry. I don't know. Um, so this prohibition applies not only to berries and pomegranates, but also to all fruits that are commonly commonly squeezed uh, for their juice in some location due to the abundance of these fruits in that place. It is forbidden to squeeze these fruits for the juices anywhere in the world, as is the halakha regarding berries and pomegranates. So, for example, oranges, or let's say um, mangoes, right? Lemons. Uh, we're going to get to lemons. Lemons is, uh, you're right, something completely different, and Zad Hashem will we'll talk about okay. lemons. Um, because no one really drinks lemon juice, right? Uh, I, don't, I don't know who went drinks lemon juice, um, and so that's that's okay. it's its own special case. It's a good question, though. Um, so so he's going to bring down some of these. You know, some sometimes you know we can think apples, banana, um, not bananas, um, mangoes, and um, and oranges. Those are kind of fruits that people drink. What about pear, right? So he said, since there are some places where pears are squeezed for their tr- fruit, this would also be forbidden to squeeze it on Shabbat. Um, like we said, apples and oranges and grapefruits that they're, um, you know, commonly squeezed for their juices, um, one may not uh, squeeze them for their juices. Um, one should avoid squeezing tomatoes even for their juices as well, unless one squeezes the juice onto a food, which we're going to get into that um, in, a, in, in a bit. It is forbidden to squeeze an orange onto sugar in a cup on Shabbat. Squeezing oranges uh, is forbidden on Yom Tov as well, but it is forbidden only by our sages, even on Shabbat. It is for, uh, it is permissible, however, to squeeze on orange onto a food so long as the majority of the juice becomes absorbed into that food. And we'll explain to that. So the main issue really with squeezing is when you want to drink it, Okay. Um, and we're going to see what happens if you squeeze it onto food, you know, 
apparently that changes everything, and, and that's why lemon is is his own case because you don't really drink lemon juice; you use it mainly for with um, with foods. Um, so again, mangoes, tangerines, pineapples, um, all these uh, fruits are usually you know, squeezed for their their uh, their juices, and so it would be forbidden by the sages to squeeze any of these fruits on Shabbat. Um, okay, it's all good here. Okay. Um, fine. Any questions before we move on? Okay. Um, it is permissible to squeeze uh, watermelons, for example, uh, on Shabbat, uh, since nowhere in the world are these fruits squeezed for their juices. The same applies to ju uh, juice of other such fruits. One may squeeze them on Shabbat, even if one plans to drink the juices as uh, as a beverage, since it is uh, since this act is viewed as separating food um, from foods. Um, this is permitted even if people do squeeze these fruits to use the juice for medical purposes. So medical purposes is a whole other issue, um, but usually you wouldn't be able to do um, or drink certain foods if it's um, if it's recognizable as a cure. Um, so, uh, for example, I don't know, some people drink apple cider vinegar to, like, cure a sore throat or something like that. So, normally people don't do that on Shabbat. It might not be allowed because um, it's it's kind of recognizable that the only reason you're doing that is probably because you have a sore throat or something like that. They, um, another example would be, like, olive oil, right? I think olive oil, so they say they help uh, sore throats. Um, so if you're doing that on Shabbat in a recognizable manner, it would not be it not be allowed. Um, of course, using a juicer um, would be forbidden on Shabbat, even if it's just a, a mechanical juicer. Now, sometimes you can just do like a crank and it juices the fruits. And that would be um, forbidden, even if we're going to say it's one of those um, items that would be allowed. For example, like we said, uh, watermelons, um, that would not be allowed um, because... It's called a uvde de chol. It's an obviously weekday activity, um, even though it's not necessarily anything. Um, no malacha. You're not using electricity. You're not you're just cranking it or whatever it is. Um, since it's something that um, is recognizable as a weekday activity, it would not be allowed on Shabbat. So now, what happens if you're coming to the you know, after kiddush? You cut open a a grape juice, a grapefruit, and you know you take your spoon and you squeeze the grape juice, the grapefruit a little bit, and you you know you get the the juices on the spoon. Are you allowed to do that? Can you like squeeze the the grapefruit itself to get the juices? So some post game rule that it is forbidden to eat a grapefruit on Shabbat by slicing it in half and digging the flesh out with a spoon, since by doing so one squeezes the juice out of the fruit pulp. The halacha is, however. Um, like other post king who permitted this, uh, since the person eating the fruit does not have intentions of juicing the fruit, even though it is inevitable. Furthermore, it is just as inevitable that a bit of pulp will be mixed with a small amount of juice that is squeezed out, and therefore it is never actually becomes a beverage. So if you want a grapefruit, even though it's super juicy, and you know when you, you cut it or when you eat it, there's going to be juices flying everywhere, you're, you're allowed to eat that because that's not necessarily your intentions. Your intention is to eat the fruit. Some post can rule that it is forbidden to the Torah. So it would be best not to suck on grapes. Kind of like, when I say suck on grapes, you know, you have the grape in your hand or whatever it is. Uh, am I on mute? Okay, no. You kind of have like the, the grape in your hand and you kind of like, just like sucking on it. But if it's in your mouth and you're sucking on it, there's not going to be an issue because... No one can really see you sucking it. It looks like you're actually eating it. Um, no, he says that here. Okay. Um, even according to the post game who ruled that it's forbidden to suck grapes, it is permissible to place the grape in one's mouth and suck out its juice and spit out the remainder. Because at this point, it's clearly an act of eating, right? You put the whole grape in your mouth, and so it's it's not something that is recognizable as sucking. Um, and so so that, that would be uh, permitted. Um, it is perfectly permissible to squeeze sour, unpalatable juice from unripe, unripe grapes directly onto food that one plans to eat immediately afterwards. This is like separating food from a mixture in order to eat it immediately afterwards, which is permitted despite the fact that some posts can uh, claim that it is forbidden. 
So if you have something that is, and this is what's going to bring us into the halachot of lemons, is that if it's something that you don't drink it by itself, for example, lemon juice, or I guess in this case, um, sour um, grapes, uh, juices of grapes, at that point, you're able to squeeze it onto food and, um, and, and eat immediately. Um, it is permissible to squeeze the liquid out of pickles, I don't know who does this, um, preserved in brine or vinegar, or to squeeze the water from boiled vegetables, even into an empty bowl. If one does not desire the liquid and wishes only to make the pickles or, or the vegetables better to eat. So let's say the, I guess the vegetables or the pickles are too, too juicy, right? So you gotta like squeeze, I guess, the, the liquid out. That's allowed, again, because no one eats, no one drinks that, uh, the, the juices. And the only reason you're doing it is because you wanna eat the, the food. Likewise, one may squeeze the oil from fried turnips, eggplants, or any other um, fried vegetable if one's intentions is to make the vegetables less oily and better to eat. Or let's say, let's say you have a souvkania, right, a, a, a jelly donut on, on Hanukkah, sometimes those are very oily, so you can uh, kind of take, I don't know if you can squeeze it out, but you can uh, try taking out some of the, the oil of that. Um, but if the person wants the liquid that he squeezes uh, from the vegetables, it is, um, However, it is permit, uh, permitted to squeeze the vet liquid only if he does so into a bowl or a plate with food in it. Um, it. It is forbidden to squeeze any liquid into an empty bowl. Let's say he wants, I don't know, let's say he wants the pickle juice or he wants the, the juice of, the, of the, the vegetables. He would only be able to squeeze it out onto a plate or a bowl where there's food. He wouldn't be able to do so in an empty um, bowl. Because again, at that point, it looks like he's because then he's going to take the bowl or whatever and he's going to drink it, right? So at that point, it looks like he's he's squeezing the the fruit out of the juice out of the fruit, and that would be um, forbidden. Okay, so now going to the squeezing of the lemons. Okay, so it is permissible. <laughs> it is permissible to squeeze lemons for the juices on Shabbat. This is the halacha following the uh, the ruling of the Shulchan Aruch, permitting this whether one squeezed the juice into an empty container to make lemonade or to add it to a food um, or if one uh, squeezes it onto another beverage. A rabbi has no right to, uh, to rule that it is forbidden to squeeze a lemon, countering the ruling of the Shulchan Aruch, since all the Sephardic Jews have accepted his ruling as binding. So someone who personally is stringent and refrains from squeezing lemons on Shabbat will receive a special blessing from Hashem, but at the end of the day, Ikar uh, technically, it's it's uh, completely allowed, okay? So when squeezing a lemon directly onto a vegetable salad, for example, one may not remove any lemon seeds that fall into the food, right? Let's say you're squeezing the lemon and the, one of the seeds fall, you wouldn't be able to take that seed out because at that point it's going to be boring. It's going to be separating. Um, I think we also talked a little bit about that over the summer, um, that you can't take the undesirable from the desirable, um, in this case, you would not be able to take out the seed that fell into the salad. Um, but there's no issue of taking the lemon and squeezing um, onto the salad. Um, when preparing lemonade on Shabbat, the correct procedure is to first pour sugar into the cup and then to squeeze the lemon onto the sugar where it will be absorbed. Um, then one pours the water onto these ingredients. Technically, it is like what we said earlier. You can you can technically put the lemon uh, into a empty cup um, and then add the sugar and water and everything else. But in order to satisfy all opinions, it's best to do it onto the sugar because at that point you're putting the lemon onto a food, onto sugar, right? Which we said is already one step um, into a more permissible territory. Um, and so, well, let's say you have your you want to make lemonade, okay? The best thing to do is you take your cup, you put the sugar, you take the lemon, pour, you squeeze whatever, fill it up with you know whatever how much lemon and sugar you have, and then you pour the water and you can you can you can mix it. The reason why we said we wouldn't do that is if we just have the empty cup and then we pour the lemon in it, it's going to be looking a little bit more like you're you're squeezing it for for its juices. Um, and we said that it's it's best not to, technically it would be permissible. There's nothing wrong with this. But there's some post games, some rabbis that say it's still not a hundred percent good, and so 
in order to do the procedure as best as we can, we put the sugar in first. That means, let's say, if you forgot to put the sugar and you went and you put the lemon first, you didn't do anything wrong. At the end of the day, you're still fine. And um, according to the Shulchan Aruch, according to uh, the Yalkut Yosef, you, you didn't do anything wrong. Um, it's just a, it's just a one step, you know, to be a, a tad bit on the cleaner side. Um, if the amount of lemon juice being squeezed onto the sugar is more than the sugar will absorb, then there is no halachic advantage of squeezing in into uh, the sugar as in, as opposed to an empty cup. So we're saying, let's say you're pouring so much uh, lemon um, into that cup of sugar, where it's going to start, you know, the, the lemon juice is going to be more than the sugar can absorb. At that point, it doesn't matter if you're going to use an empty cup or a, um, a sugar-filled cup, because at the end of the day, the whole purpose was to make it look like you're pouring it onto the sugar. But now if there's so much lemon, ju lemon juice that it's going to, you know, be the majority, it doesn't matter where you put the, the sugar or the empty cup. So it's up to you. Okay, fine. So when preparing tea, right, sometimes people like uh, the tea with lemon juice. Um, one may not first squeeze or pour the lemon juice onto the sugar and then pour the hot water from a clearition onto it. Why is that? <coughs> um, because if the water is really hot, um, it will cook the lemon juice as it is being poured. Right? If, if we remember, we said the best thing to do with tea is usually to take, let's say, the hot water, and then this is going to be the klisheni, and then you pour it into a klishlishi, and then you do whatever you want to do. You can add the sugar, you can add the salt, you can add the tea bag, whatever it is. At that point, it's the best. But let's say you don't have a klishlishi, you only have a klisheni. At that point, you don't want to pour the um, the you don't want to pour the lemon juice beforehand, because then when you pour the water into it, it's going to cook the uh, the um, the lemon juice lemon juice before it even has a chance to be in the in the cup, and so that would not be allowed. So, correct procedure is to first pour the hot water, um, and then you put the sugar or the uh, lemon juice, whatever it is needed. Um, of course, klishlishi is always the best when it comes to tea because um, there's a there's a question if you're cooking the tea leaves when you put in the in the tea. And so, even in the klisheni, we said that there is still uh, bishul. Um, yeah. So even even if you, for example, like what we said, if you pour from a klisheni into a klisheni, and then you put an egg into it, that's still considered cooking, right? But if you put it into a klishlishi, at that point we say there's no cooking. And so you can put the, the egg, you can put the tea, whatever it needs to be. Okay? Um, fine. It is permissible to rub a piece of lemon, uh, squeezed lemon, to remove grease and other dirt from one's hands, even though one uh, squeezes the juices from the lemon at the same time. So I think sometimes you can you can clean, like they say, the same. Sometimes you know to uh, clean the stove or something, you can take a lemon and clean it. So over here we're saying we want to clean our hands. Let's say there's grease or dirt or whatever it is, we can take a lemon and we can you know clean our hands, um, even though there might be some juices that are coming out. Then the you're you're doing it mainly because you want to um, clean your hands. Okay, makes sense with lemon. Any yeah. questions? No. no, no. It's 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 a little bit uh, lemons is a little bit nicer, you know, less uh, less restrictions as compared. <laughs> uh, but it makes more sense because I I don't know nowadays if anyone really takes an orange and squeezes an orange um, for our orange juice or anything. Um, but lemons, yeah, lemons you usually you see nowadays, a lot of people use it for salads, for for fish, or whatever it may be. And um, so we see that, that that's a, it's allowed. Okay, it is permissible to squeeze a cluster of grapes into a plate of food or into a bowl containing food on Shabbat. This juice has the halachic status of a food, not a beverage, since it is being combined with the food, and therefore the act of squeezing these fruits is considered separate, uh, separating a food from a food, which is per, uh, perfectly permissible. The forbid, uh, the act forbidden by uh, the forbidden act, we said that of mefarek is taking the beverage from the food. But if you're taking the beverage of a food and putting it into a food, it's like you're taking food and putting it into a food. So let's say I know some people like to eat, um, uh, I don't know, meat. You know, usually can be cooked well with 
with uh, wine, right? Let's say you don't have wine, though. You have grapes. So you kind of like squirt the, the juices of the uh, grapes onto the meat. That would be fine. Because at the end of the day, it's going from food to food, but not from food to drink. The problem would be if you know, I were to take a cup and squeeze the grapes, then it's going from food to drink, which food to drink, we said, is not allowed. Um, it, is certain, uh, it certainly is permissible to squeeze other fruits such as oranges or grapefruits onto a bowl of food for the same reason. One may squeeze oranges onto a fruit salad or shredded uh, carrots to flavor them. One may also squeeze fruits onto a mashed uh, banana or apple to prepare it for a baby. So we find that, you know, let's say you're, you're making a fruit salad, right? And you want to you don't want to put oranges in it, you want to make it like orange flavor. So you want to squeeze some orange juice on it, okay? So that would be allowed, again, because you're going from food to food and not food to drink. Um, this is permitted only if there are is more solid food in the dish than liquid. So that's the key, right? Because if there's a point where it's more liquid or, let's say, more sauce, um, then it could be a question whether you're using it for the, the, the actual food or you're using it for the, the, the liquid in there. And so in that case, the liquid, or at least most of it, is absorbed into the solid food and served to enhance it. And the liquid is therefore considered part of the food. If there's only little food and there's a lot of, um, a, a lot of liquid, then it could be uh, an issue because it looks like you're adding the, the, um, the juices for the, for the drink, for the liquid, and not for the food itself. And so that's an issue. I said the same thing with uh, cooking, for example. <clears throat> and this is a big issue. Um, let's say you have a, a pot of, uh, let's say, a fish. And there's a lot of sauce on the fish. It would be an issue of putting that, um, that plate onto a hot plate because the, the sauces might um, heat up and, and cook. Because that, that's, like we said in Svartis, we don't allow the soup to be heated up on the on the plata on, on Saturday, right? On Friday night, you can leave it on before Shabbat and leave it on until after Shabbat. And let's say you leave it on until Shabbat morning, that's allowed. The problem is once you take it off, <laughs> yeah, as long as it's still in your hands, it, it's fine. But once you put it down somewhere else, you can't really put it back on. Because um, we're worried that you're gonna, it's gonna come back to cooking. Um, so it's not only with liquids, it's also with sauces, which is uh, technically a liquid. Um, and so, if you made a, a um, meat or <clears throat> fish that has a lot of sauce, the issue would be um, putting it onto the electric warming tray, and it would also be an issue with squeezing uh, fruit onto it. Um, <clears throat> again, this is, wouldn't be an issue with lemons, um, mainly because lemons is something that um, you, we don't really drink it by itself. That, that's the main thing with uh, um, lemons. Okay, um, I think we'll leave it off there today. Um, and Bezrat Hashem will, uh, and Bezrat Hashem will, uh, will continue next week. Um, I think we'll be able to finish squeezing next week, and we'll move on to uh, something else. Um, I'll have to ask Rabbi. But um, a lot of a lot of the, the the main things that we did today was the, the main idea of squeezing. The the rest is going to be kind of more subtle, for example, squeezing um, snow to get water, right? Is that allowed? And so we'll um, we'll see that next week. Okay. Any questions before uh, before we call it a day? Any questions online? I don't even know if this is working. Okay. Very good. I hope everyone has a has a great rest of the night. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. What other fruits are okay to squeeze besides watermelon?